So the last time we had a lesson, we ended up with this expression here derived through a variational method. Um, as a reminder, the path in space-time, we are using this form of notation, the path in space-time that we're uh, discovering here is given by x superscript nu as a function of the parameter lambda. And this is the resulting geodesic equation where s is this path length itself, this, ex this path length that we are basically running the, uh, we're extre uh, extremizing this path length. It ends up being the longest path length usually. And then uh, because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, s dot is the Lagrangian, or, or this path interval. We're calling it the Lagrangian because that's, Lagrangian dynamics is what models this whole, is where, where we develop this whole idea. So usually what we're extremizing, what the integrand of what the integral that is being, uh, uh, in this case, uh, maximized, that uh, we'll call that the Lagrangian. So S dot is, is the Lagrangian, S double dot is the Lagrangian with respect to the parameter lambda. So we could tighten this up a little bit, um, and many books do, simplifying these terms, not simplifying, but uh, changing the notation of those terms, and I'll do that now. And it looks like this. This, all the dots represent derivatives with respect to lambda. And that harkens back to sort of your elementary Newtonian mechanics when you used a dot to represent the derivative with respect to time. In this case, we're doing it with respect to the parameter of the curve, but as we'll see in a, as we usually are want to do, that parameter is usually the proper time of that curve, a proper time of a clock moving along that curve. So it does end up kind of being like time. But it, this does not necessarily insist that it's the pr uh, proper time. In fact, it can't be because the proper time is an affine parameter, and as long as there's a term over here, we know that the parameterization of this geodesic, or this geodesic here, is not going to be... Um, uh, it's not going to be an affine parameter, because if it was, this would be zero. But we can make it zero by choosing lambda, by choosing lambda to equal the path length. All right, by choosing lambda to equal s, then all of a sudden, uh, lambda dot, or, or la lambda dot, or I should say, I should say s dot, right? then all of a sudden s dot equals 1 and s double dot equals 0 and then this whole side does equal 0. So that is, uh, and that's where we left off last week. So another slight simplification, I don't know if it's that much of a simplification but it does show up in some texts, is using the logarithmic derivative. This is a, a basic fact that is definitely worth remembering because it shows up a lot. But if I have a function of lambda and I take the derivative of the logarithm of that function of lambda, that is, and it's not hard to see, that is the derivative of the function with respect to lambda over the derivative, right? They're both functions of lambda. And because of that, if I put a dot here, I get a second dot there and a first dot there, so I could write this as d by d lambda log s x dot nu. And frequently you do in fact see the uh, right hand side of this written in that way. Um, okay, so now uh, about null curves. If we're given a curve in space-time and we are told it's a null curve, we know that that means its length it's it, it, uh, the integration of its of these incremental lengths all along the curve is zero, and this is expressed in the following way: g mu nu of x dot mu x dot nu equals zero, or this expression equals zero. Really, it's equivalent statement. And when that equals zero everywhere, that's basically saying that using the language of our variational method, the Lagrangian, this Lagrangian is zero everywhere. 
And it's hard to run that argument, that basic argument we had using this as the Lagrangian for the case where this is always equal to zero. Because when you execute a variation on this, um, it's hard to understand what that variation means if it's always, if the length is always zero. So there's a different uh, technique. That, it's the same technique, but the fact is, is we introduce a different Lagrangian to solve the problem. And that Lagrangian looks like this. Lagrangian is going to be one-half g alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta divided by something we call an auxiliary function of lambda only minus, and I'll call the co constant m squared times the same auxiliary function. Now if you do the same work we just did with now, now L, because of this auxiliary function, L is a function of the generalized coordinate x, the uh, derivative of x, n, and of course lambda. And remember, x was a function of lambda, x dot was a function of lambda, n is a function of lambda, and of course you have lambda. So everything's still, so the parameter value is still there, and it's still a function of those parameter values. Now if you did, if you ran the Euler-Lagrange equation, which I remind you is, um, it's an equation, it's one for each dimension, right? So we have d by d lambda of l x dot uh, I'll, I'll go with alpha, um, minus dl dx alpha equals zero. So really, this that's the way we've done it before, but that only accounts for the four values of x alpha, the four generalized coordinates of x alpha. And where you put x alpha here and x alpha dot there. So there's four equations. So now there needs to be one more since we've now added another basically independent variable called n. And when you do that, you end up with the additional Lagrange equation, or Euler-Lagrange equation, partial l partial n dot, where that dot is with respect to lambda, minus partial l partial n. Now there's no superscript here because there's only one n, right? There's four x's, so you need the superscript there, but you don't need it there. You, there's only one. But if you look at this, this is done very carefully. This is The Lagrangian is not a function of n dot. It's not a function of the first derivative. So this whole term goes away, and you're left with just, well, I can get rid of that too because of the zero. So I, you end up with just dldn. And what is that going to be? Well, that's going to be this value right here, right? You get 1 over n squared from this term, minus 1 over n squared, minus m squared equals 0. And then uh, you just multiply through by n squared, and you get g alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta well, through by through by negative 1 plus m squared n equals 0. So now, now you're free to choose this constant m, and if you choose m equal to b0, you end up with this constraint g alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta equals 0. And that constraint is forced upon you by this Lagrangian. So this Lagrangian will now take that constraint into account. And then the other equation of motion, um, and I'll let you do it, but if you solve this, if you solve this, you can use exactly the same technique we used when we solved it previously without this n, right, without that n. And notice, this term just goes away for everything we do because um, there's no dependence on x or x dot. So that, that term in the Lagrangian is always just gone. So you're really just working with this term. And the only place where this shows up is with this derivative, d by d lambda, 
because it's only a function of lambda. So it's basically a constant as far as this derivative goes or that derivative goes, but it's not a constant with respect to this one. So the change is actually very minor. And in the end, what does the equation end up looking like? And the answer is, is it looks like this. It's basically the same on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you have a function of x dot, which is exactly what you're looking for for a geodesic that is not, uh, not parameterized within a fine parameter, right? Because it's, it's a function times the derivative of the, uh, of the tangent vectors. So, or times the tangent vector. X dot is the tangent vector. So you have a function times the tangent vector, which is a non-affinely parameterized geodesic. So this Lagrangian here, this Lagrangian here, gives us the, essentially this, the geodesic equation and this constraint. And if I had changed this m to a different value, then I could be dealing with space-like or time-like um, uh, space-like or time-like geodesics by just adjusting the value of f this constant m squared. So this gives us a lot of flexibility, and it ends up with this expression. So there's just this is just another way to use the variational method to get geodesics, even in the case when you have light-like geodesics. Um, and uh, this is often written in books where they just say, hey, when you work this out, you just get some function of lambda times uh, uh, the, uh, the tangent vector, right? So you'll often see that. And again, this logarithmic derivative is meant to be, I guess, x dot nu, and it'll be uh, n dot over n, right? That's how it looks. So, so this variational method does work pretty generally, but it is important to understand both methods, the mathematical method of getting there and this variational method. So now uh, I want to cover just a couple other topics about geodesics before we move on. So you may remember back in lesson six, I discussed the conformal compactified coordinates. And actually, I never did discuss the actual conformal compactified coordinates because that's this thing, which I crossed out and said, pay no attention to. Because what I was really interested at that time was explaining how you can go through all of these coordinate transformations, ultimately getting these two expressions and ultimately getting this expression from the Minkowski metric, the spherical Minkowski metric. So back then what we did is we took the regular Minkowski metric. I think I probably even started off with minus one, 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 right? Constant throughout space-time converted it into a spherical metric and uh, thereby giving, so this was, this would have been your uh, t, x, y, z type coordinates and then converted it into t, r, theta, phi coordinates, which was the Minkowski, spherical Minkowski coordinates and then we derived the spherical Minkowski metric. And then we just started going from there to getting a light cone metric, and then we compactified the light cone metric with the arctangent function, and then we added some things together, and ultimately we ended up with this metric here. And this metric is still Minkowski, it's still Minkowski, right? I mean, it's still the Min a met metric of flat Minkowski space-time. It just looks so different because we did so many different coordinate transformations, and we ultimately got this thing. Now, all of those coordinate transformations in this catalog of space-times, which is what I'm going back to referring to now, all of those coordinate transformations that got us from the regular old Minkowski metric to this monster are embodied in the, in the catalog in this very convenient and quick expression where you start with T and R. Actually, that's starting with these spherical, Minkowski spherical metric. Uh, and of course, we have t. C, we set t, c equals to one. So we have t plus r equals the tangent of the sum of the two new coordinates over two, and t minus r is the tangent of the difference of the two coordinates over two, psi and uh, xi. And uh, in lesson six, I walked through the entire process of what this means and how to get there step by step without having to use these explicit, these implicit expressions here. So, but once we did that, we ended up with a flat metric expressed in 
um, these new coordinates, psi and xi. Now that is a flat metric, right? That's identical to flat space-time. But now, the last step to get conformal compactified coordinates is to multiply by omega squared, which they have as 4 cosine squared psi plus psi cosine squared psi minus psi, right? You take this, basically what's in the denominator here, right? You take what's in the denominator, you call that omega squared, and you multiply the metric by it, you create the new metric, which is this uh, conformal factor times the old metric, and that relationship is a relationship between two metrics, what we call conf conformal. These two metrics are conformal. So notice this isn't a coordinate change, right? This is, I'm literally taking a metric and multiplying it by a function of space-time. And this is a function of space-time. It's a function of psi and it's a function of psi. It's not a function of theta or phi because it just isn't, right? Those two variables don't appear in this particular conformal transformation. They could have, and it would still have been conformal. But as long as omega is a function of space-time, which it is, if you take a, uh, a line element, which is the same thing as saying a metric, right? The, this, another way of writing this is g alpha beta hat equals omega squared, a function of space-time, times g alpha beta, right? Each component of the old metric multiplied by this conformal factor is the component of the new metric, right? That's what this is basically saying. Um, but, uh, uh, so we're creating a new metric. This metric is the physical metric. If our space-time is flat, you know, uh, the, there's no curvature of space-time because there's no matter, it's just classic special relativity, then this is the physical metric of that condition. That metric goes over here. The metric on the left side is some other metric multiplied by this factor. And that metric is the unphysical metric. So this is the unphysical metric. The unphysical metric. And this unphysical metric, it actually looks very close to being the spherical Minkowski metric, but it's not because it's got that sine squared here. So if you attempted to say, okay, wait a minute, if, if this was a T and if that was an R, then that would be an R, that would look just like, uh, if, that was, if this thing here was R squared, then it would look just like the spherical Minkowski metric. But that's not R squared, that's sine squared R. And because the process that took us to get to this point, we ended up restricting the value of uh, xi to zero between zero and pi, which of course is is necessary. Uh, and, and to see why, you'd have to go back to uh, uh, lesson six in this series. So it's it's a different. It ends up that this is a different metric, and in fact, that metric is called the Einstein static universe. And uh, maybe we'll talk about it later. But it's it's close, but it's not exactly right. But the point is is that. The Einstein static universe is conformally related to flat space-time. The Einstein static universe, or at least a portion of the Einstein static universe, right? Because you've got these restrictions. We ended up, when we produced this thing, um, you know, the, the whole point of producing this metric and these coordinates was to take all of space-time and take the infinities and put them on the plane in a place we could actually see them and understand all of Minkowski space-time in one small diagram. That was the whole point of Lesson 6, or part of the point of Lesson 6, at least. And so doing, we ended up with heavy restrictions on all these coordinates. So what would have been the time coordinate, which could normally go from minus infinity to plus infinity, is only going from minus pi to pi, showing that we're putting the entire time axis uh, in a limited interval. Same with uh, R, right? R gets compactified in a limited interval. But it still has to be greater than zero, but it only goes to pi. Anyway, um, the point is, is that this complex flat space-time metric gets converted into this one using a conformal transformation. So uh, the reason I'm introducing this idea is I want to talk about the geodesics, the geodesic curves of the unphysical metric and the geodesic curves of the physical metric. We're now going to be dealing with two different, two different space-times. It'll be a four-dimensional manifold, which I'll call M, 
and the unphysical metric will be g hat, and then this is the same four-dimensional manifold with a metric g. And notice when I say we've got the same manifold in both of these models, what I mean is we have the same coordinate system, right? F uh, psi, psi, theta, and phi. Psi, psi, theta, and phi. So we have the same coordinate system in um, on top. Of the, so the manifold is the same, but the metrics are different. This is the metric that corresponds to the model of physical reality, and this is an unphysical metric that is related by this conformal transformation. So now my question is, is if I knew about geodesics in the real metric, what do I know about them in this related metric? So let's have a look at that. So to understand the geodesics in any space-time, I'm looking at this kind of expression right here. We kind of beat that guy to death, except here I'm saying the tangent vector to a curve x. So presumably I have a curve parameterized by lambda that I'm giving as x of lambda. That's the coordinates along that curve. I suppose I could put a little mu up here and a little mu up there. And the uh, tangent vector to that curve I'm going to refer to as x dot mu. So I take the tangent vector to uh, a tangent vectors along this curve. This is the uh, the term that we study to uh, ge develop the geodesics, right? That if it, for example, equals zero, then I'll have a finely um, parameterized geodesic. Otherwise, uh, if I don't, I'll have it. It'll be some it'll be some constant on the space or some function on the space time times the tangent vector itself, and that will still be a geodesic, but not a finely parameterized. But the point is, I want to be able to study this guy, and I'm going to study it in the physical, the physical space-time will have a metric, and that metric will give me a metric connection of the physical space-time, which is here in red. The unphysical space-time will have its own metric, g hat, and that metric will give me its metric connection in here depicted in green. And the problem is, is that if you have two different connections, these are what define parallelism on the manifold. So the manifold um, will have two different concepts of parallelism. Well, this manifold will have one concept of parallelism driven by this connection, and this manifold will have a different concept of parallelism driven by that connection. I'm just, my language is getting really sloppy. What I should say is, the manifold is the same in both cases, and we've, uh, we, we've chosen the same manifold, and we've also chosen the same coordinate system on the, both of these manifolds. So the manifolds are identical in their mathematical structure and also identical in the coordinate system we have chosen to lay down upon them. That's really important. But in this first pairing, I pair it with what I call the physical metric, and that gives me a physical metric connection, and then in this pairing I chose a non-physical metric, and it gives me a non-physical metric connection. And the key for this discussion is that the relationship between the two is conformal, meaning it's a simple product of this function omega squared on the space-time. Sometimes, by the way, if you look in the literature, you'll see it is written as e, um, uh, e to the omega times g. The point is you want this always to be positive, right? That's really important. Um, and uh, uh, because you don't, otherwise it'll change the signature of the metric. But um, so we end up with these two different versions of parallelism. So there's really no reason whatsoever to think that the geodesics in this pairing and the geodesics in that pairing are going to be the same curves. And I can talk about the same curves because this this the same manifold with the same coordinate system. So if I get a geodesic curve in, say, the first pairing, it's just a list of coordinate points in space-time for, uh, for some vector field, right? For some vector, for some set of tangent vectors, x prime, or x dot. There's no reason to think that that collection of points will be the same in the, uh, in the other pairing, because you have a different set of, of, of ideas of parallelism. When you parallel transport this guy, it's going to just parallel transport differently than if you parallel transport that guy.
But we want to see if we can understand this difference a little bit better. So in order to understand these geodesics, I have to understand this idea here, which means I have to understand the covariant derivatives in both of these pairings. And the covariant derivatives are defined this way. Here it's defined with the red uh, or the, the physical metric connection. Here it's defined with the unphysical metric connection. And the difference between these two covariant derivatives is going to be directly related to the difference between the physical and the, un the unphysical and the physical uh, covariant derivatives. So we want to study this difference. So let's do that. So this is the metric connection in the first, in the physical space-time, this physical space-time where G is our, uh, our appropriate metric suitable for whatever the physical space-time is. Um, now we want to write the same expression. We want to write this expression for the new metric in the uh, unphysical space-time. And the thing we that guides us is that the unphysical space-time metric is equal to omega squared times the physical space-time metric. By the way, the reason we use an omega squared is basically to the calculation I'm about to do. You'll see that it kind of gets a little, it's simplified without the, um, if the square is in there at that point. It's, it's got to, it's got to be positive, right? So, um, although if it was negative, it would start changing the signature of the metric, and we're not interested in doing that. So it's got to be a positive number, but also the square is a bit convenient anyway. So with that in mind, um, we will start making some substitutions to calculate the, the metric connection associated with this with this metric, the unphysical metric, because we already know the metric connection with this one, which is that right there. And so the next step is pretty obvious. I'm substituting this directly into here. And what I've done is I've taken this notation up here that simplifies things. You know how I like to write G alpha beta line delta, where the line represents a single regular partial derivative as opposed to a covariant derivative, which would have been two lines. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm writing that as in this other form, G alpha beta. That's the same form, but it's a little bit easier here because I'm going to be using the product rule, and that putting the line there, it's kind of hard to represent that we'll need the product rule. But if I use this form, put that out there, and then substitute for uh, uh, G hat, then you can see I'm going to take the partial derivative of everything inside. Right, everything inside. And remember, omega is a function of the coordinate, so we're going to have to take a product rule. We're going to have to take the derivative of this factor and the derivative of that factor. So let's do that. All right, and there's the next expression, right, where we are taking these partial derivatives. So this partial derivative here becomes these two factors, just through the product rule. It's the product rule on these two factors, and then the derivative of the first one is the chain rule. So you end up with this two omega out front, and then this partial derivative of just omega, which we don't know, we can't specify it. And then we have the partial, um, and then just multiplied by the second factor, and then omega squared, which is the first factor, times the derivative of the second factor. You know, I could have actually done uh, this term here. This term here could have been written as omega one line delta. That would have been a little bit cleaner. Right, uh, in the sense that I get rid of some symbols, so uh, but uh, I didn't do it. I just kept the once I switched into the partials, I left it that way, which is probably fine. Maybe I'll change it next time. But now I'm going to do something pretty straightforward. If you look at if you look at these three terms here, right, these three terms here times omega squared, um, I can move those to the front. Right, everything's sum. So I, I can well, I'm not moving to the front. I can I can I can take this factor that leads the entire expression in brackets, and collect these three terms together, pull out the omega squared to cancel with this omega squared, and I'll end up with one half g alpha delta times these three um, derivatives of the physical metric, and that actually equals the physical metric. So if I do that, what will I have left over? So now 
um, I've done that. So I took these three terms and multiplied by this leading factor and ended up with this expression here. So I wrote that part in black. So that's the physical metric. And then what's left over is this, right? The, uh, the, two, comes, the two from each of these terms. So these terms are gone. So the two from these terms here cancels with the one half. This omega takes out one factor of omega from the denominator of the leading term. Then these three terms, these partial derivatives of omega, I rewrote in that notation I described before, right, with the slash notation. So that's just a rewriting, and then these factors remain. So then I, I can actually simplify this quite a bit, right, because this times this, look, that's, that's g alpha delta, g delta gamma. That's the delta function. That's going to end up being the delta function of... Uh, alpha gamma and this and this product this times this that's alpha delta delta beta that's going to be the delta function of alpha and beta but this last one it doesn't work out you have alpha delta and beta gamma right alpha delta beta gamma ah uh, that there's no it's it, it's not a um there's no Einstein sum there to work off of. So that one's not, so this last one with the minus sign, that's not going to simplify. So, uh, but let's make those simplifications. And there you have it. This thing here is the, um, is this now, this guy here, I guess, uh, let's see, I should, I should be writing the green version, alpha, beta, gamma. The, the metric uh, the metric connection in the unphysical in the un the unphysical metric connection is equal to the physical metric connection plus this weird term here this weird term here and if you look at this weird term you've got alpha up and you have beta gamma down alpha up beta gamma down alpha up beta gamma down because that delta here that delta sums so I could write this as um, equals gamma alpha beta gamma plus there's another object out there which I'll call capital psi alpha beta gamma. So and that, of course, this is just shorthand for all of that up there. All right, so now the object we want to study is a tangent vector to a curve, so we're going to call that tangent vector x dot uh, gamma partial gamma or, or covariant derivative of gamma with respect to uh, covariant derivative of gamma uh, x dot, you know, not gamma, uh, x dot uh, alpha. Right, that's the object we want to. Well, that's the object we would want to study as the geodesics of the curve whose tangent vector is x dot gamma in the physical space time, the physical space time m g. But we also want to study because we're going to. The point is to compare the two of this guy, the same tangent vectors, but now using the covariant derivative of the unphysical space-time g hat, right? Where the distinction between the two now we know is that the metric connection of g hat is the same as the metric connection of g, but it's got this other term in it. It's got this term psi. And this isn't too difficult to see, but this expression here is going to equal that expression there plus a piece that's missing out of here, which has to do with the difference of the two connections. And in fact, if I rearrange this a little bit, uh, let's see, let me rearrange this a little bit by moving this, well, I'll move that here. I didn't move that very far, did I? Then I'll take this and I'll move that there, right? And that will equal that, um, but it will be, but there'll be an additional term, and that additional term will be, will be this little piece here, this little piece right here, and 
if you put that all together, you'll see that, I mean, if you go back to these definitions, well, you don't even, we did it for you, right? The, uh, you're just adding the part of the connection that's missing from the physical metric to make the unphysical metric. And you've got to add that little part back in. And you do that, and this is the expression you get. So now we can study this expression in more detail. So let's take this green part right here and slap in front of it this to make x dot beta x dot gamma and let's simplify let's simplify this expression and see if we can get uh, a nice concise expression of this geodesic term in the unphysical metric with respect to the geodesic term in the physical metric we're basically going to substitute back for this delta and so here is that expression this guy blown up by making this substitution here. So I'm taking this whole thing. The first part, the first thing I do is I take this one over omega and move it in here, and then I get omega, a derivative of omega over one over omega. So I write that as a logarithmic derivative everywhere. So it's everywhere a logarithmic derivative. I bring this inside, and then I execute the delta function, which turns the alpha to a gamma. So I have x beta alpha. And then I do it for this term. I have x, um, I have x beta x gamma, x beta x alpha here, x beta x gamma here. And then I have this partial logarithmic derivative here, and I have x beta with an up index, and then an x beta with a lower index, because when this guy came inside, this beta gamma just lowered the gamma to be a beta. And so I have this this uh, sum over uh, x dot here, and then I've got g uh, gamma, oops, I sh that should be, um, that's wrong. This last term here should be uh, g alpha delta, like that, Cause, because uh, this g beta gamma was consumed by lowering the index on, on uh, x gamma, x dot gamma. And so we have that. Now, we look and we say, well, this is a dummy index. This gammas are dummy indices, right? So I can change them to betas, and then this term and that term are exactly the same. So that means that this guy equals 2 times partial beta ln omega x dot beta x dot alpha, just like that. And this guy over here, there's not too much I can do with. I'm going to leave it as minus delta ln omega, then this is really the magnitude of x dot, right? The magnitude of the magnitude of the tangent vector, and then g alpha delta. So what do I have? So let me take everything and put it into one final expression. And there we have the final expression. Um, Remember, this magnitude idea, just in case you're forgetting, x alpha x alpha, right, that is the, that is the magnitude of, of the, the vector x, whatever the vector x is. In this case, the vector x is the tangent vector to the curve, which is why we're noting uh, it as x dot. So that's what this magnitude means, right? So it's, I'm just replacing that with this notion of the magnitude. Um, all right, so this uh, is not a very helpful expression, actually, because it's basically telling us that these geodesics um, are going to be the same as these geodesics, except for all of this. And uh, this is not simply of the form x dot times some function of the space-time, right? If it was, then... Uh, uh, if this was some was if this section here, if all of this was just in this form, then it would still be a geodesic. But it's not a function of just the space time. It's actually a function of it's a nonlinear function of the um, uh, the well, it's a nonlinear function of the tangent vectors, right? Because you've got the magnitude of the tangent vectors here, so. 
that's actually sort of a non that's a nonlinear function of the two tangent vectors. So you don't have this linear function of just x dot. You've got that, and then you've got this metric in there. But uh, but this is the real problem, right? That it's it's not a uh, linear function of the tangent vectors themselves, which is the whole point of being a geodesic. So that's not, you know, we did a lot of work, but there's a reason we did this work is because under certain circumstances, this is very helpful. And that's under the circumstance when we're dealing with null geodesics, when x dot alpha x dot alpha equals zero for a null geodesic, which is the same as saying g um, mu nu x dot mu x dot nu equals zero. When that's the case, when you have a light-like um, tangent vector to the curve is always of null, meaning you have a light-like geodesic, then all of a sudden this term here goes away, and that's the term with the problem. And once that go, and also, if you consider, if you go into the uh, the physical metric, the physical uh, space time, the physical metric with the physical uh, covariant derivative, and we say, okay, if these are null, we know that this represents this is a null geodesic. Let's say it's a finely parameterized. We've finely parameterized it, so we know that x dot gamma physical covariant derivative x dot alpha equals zero, then that goes away too. And what you're ultimately left with is this, the unphysical metrics um, geodesic expression equals this. But if you look at this, this guy beta sums out with a, uh, a function on the space-time. So that actually is a function on the space-time. And that's a function on the space-time multiplied by a, uh, a tangent vector, which is in this form. So that means that we are charting out geodesic paths. Um, that, that means that for null vectors, this expression just automatically, as long as the vector is null, and as long as the metric is conformally related through this elaborate relationship up here, right? That's all based on the fact that the two metrics were conformally related. If I have two covariant derivatives that are connected because the, their metric, they are the covariant derivatives associated with metric connections for metrics which are conformally related, then I know that the null geodesics of that thing are going to map out the exact same curves as the null geodesics in the physical metric. In other words, the fact that the two metrics are conformally related means the null geodesics, at least, once because the null geodesics get rid of the troubling term, those things map out the same curves in space-time. They're parameterized differently, right? Because this, this term is, you're never going to make, this term's not going anywhere, right? That term will always be there. So, the, the the parameterization of the curve in the unphysical metric will be different from the parameterization in the physical metric, which we assume to be a fine. We assume that the parameterization in the physical metric was a fine, so we got rid of that term. But the parameterization in the non-physical metric won't be a fine, but it will still trace out the same path. You know, and I think it's worth um, worth making that point particularly clear, right? If I have a path in space-time, you know, I can have a, a lambda parameter, and that path can be parameterized by a curve mu, right? And it'll it'll start from a point, and as lambda mo goes up, you know, that'll be at lambda 0, then at, say, lambda 0. 0.5, and then out here at lambda, uh, well, lambda 0, Yes, I better stick with lambda one, and then at some value lambda two, it's up. It's up here. But I can have another parameterization of the same path, right? With sigma, and uh, sigma zero might be here, and sigma one might be there, and sigma two might be there, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, it can speed up and slow down depending on the nature of this curve, which I might call. See, gamma, I might call this curve. Uh, 
um, you know, eta of sigma, you know, mu. The, the point is, though, is that the curve itself, the curve itself, each point on the curve is, is going to have coordinates. The coordinates of, say, that particular point are going to be eta 0 sigma, eta 1 sigma, eta 0 sigma 2, eta 1 sigma 2, eta um, 2 sigma 2, and eta 3 sigma 2, right? That's going to be the coordinates of that point. And the coordinates of that point might very well be, uh, well, might also be then uh, gamma 0 of lambda. See, I use lambda 0 here and lambda 1 there. So say lambda 0.5 and gamma 1 of lambda 0.5, etc., right? So that point... But those, that, but that point is one point in space time. These are always going to be the same values. In other words, that value and that value is going to be the same. The curve that's sketched out, the curve that's created by these two parameterizations, is the same curve. And if I'm a falling body, free falling on this geodesic, the my the difference in coordinate time, which is this first coordinate between this point and this point is the same regardless of what parameterization I use. The parameterization is just a way to characterize the curve. So if so the point is is that if I use the if I use the unphysical covariant derivative versus the physical covariant derivative, I get the exact same curve which tells me exactly how this light ray is going to move in space-time because I'm assuming now I'm dealing with null uh, tangent vectors. And but the curve it, they both trace out is going to be identical. It's just the rate at which the parameter that they use to trace out the curves will be different. So the point is the shape of the curve will still be the same. The coordinate values that the curve goes through will be the same. Because remember, both of these use the same coordinate system. It's just the metric that's different, and it's conformally related. And this is important because um, ultimately when we do more with Penrose diagrams, we're going to see that light rays in Penrose diagrams are going to move on 45 degree lines just like light rays would on uh, a conformally related diagram which is flat space or it's actually something called the Einstein static universe which we mentioned briefly before. Okay so that covers some last uh, discussions about geodesics. What we learned today is we learned a little bit about the geodesics of null, null geodesics. We talked about null geodesics and uh, uh, the Lagrangian that's used for null geodesics being different, but still ending up with a very nice and clean uh, answer. And then uh, we discussed conformal metrics and the conformal compactified coordinates, and we looked at the geodesics of conformal metrics, uh, of two metrics that are conformally related, and we see that they are generally different, meaning they're the paths traced out in space-time are not the same. And of course they won't be the same because the two metrics are different, right? And when the two metrics are different, you're going to have a different metric connection, and that's what tells you what's parallelism. So the idea of being parallel, shouldn't it shouldn't be the same. But under the case of null geodesics, it turns out that the offending part uh, goes away, and uh, it turns out for null geodesics, the G the geodesic paths, the coordinates of the geodesic paths are in fact the same. Okay, so we'll move on to a new subject next time.